Good afternoon, everyone. I am Melissa Cherry, the Chief Operating Officer here at Destinations International. It is so great to have all of you with us today for this webinar. Today's webinar, just so you know, is being recorded and will be archived in the Destinations International Learning Center. A link of this webinar will be sent to all attendees following today's session. Before we kick this off, however, let me do a few housekeeping notes. As always, we'd love to hear your questions and comments. Questions may be submitted at any time and panels will try and answer them throughout the webinar. We will also open up for Q&A at the end to answer some questions that are also being posted. When you have a question, please, uh, for our presenters, please enter it into the Q&A box on your Zoom screen. I would also like to rem remind everyone that we have our upcoming and past webinars listed in our online learning center. Please visit learningcenter.destinations.org to learn more. And finally, None of this could be possible about without our sponsors. So I'd like to take this opportunity to recognize our strategic partners who make this possible and support us throughout the year. Um, now is more critical than ever that your support is really important and we can't thank you enough. So this afternoon, um, we are very excited to host in partnership with Blacks in Travel and Tourism, um, our webinar on incorporating an equity, diversity, and inclusion strategy to enhance organizational culture. At Destinations International, equity, diversity, inclusion is one of our five key strategic objectives that drives the association. In 2018, we launched our first EDI task force to address how we would drive and support that strategy. Today, that task force continues to be led by Al Hutchinson at Visit Baltimore, Kelly Henderson at Searchwide Global, and John Percy at Destination Niagara USA, along with nearly 70 members serving on the task force from across our CBB and industry partners. With recent events over the last several months that have challenged our thinking, our understanding, and now our call to action to address equity, diversity, and inclusion, Destinations International felt it was critical to take a moment to review our work and how we can impact change when it comes to EDI. In July, through the work of our task force, we redrafted our mission statement and goal. At DI, our mission through equity, diversity, and inclusion is to recognize and advocate the importance of cultivating a unified travel industry where everyone is welcome, that there is an equitable access for all, and that we continue to challenge the existing power structures so that all voices and perspectives can be heard. Our goal is to continue to drive collaboration to lead and engage EDI initiatives that will impact social change for the benefit of our members, focused on the five core areas of CEO engagement, industry partnerships, university partnerships, research and workforce development. So there's a lot of work to do. Through a recent survey, members identified three critical areas of need our destination organization members need. One, the need for training on EDI and subconscious bias. The second, the need for a creative, to create a diverse and inclusive work environment. And finally, the need for CVBs to have a greater understanding of EDI to be embraced and internally implemented. So in partnership with Blacks in Travel and Tourism, we are very excited today to co-host this webinar as they share insights on understanding what an inclusive culture is and the strategies for engaging multicultural audiences. Now, I would like to welcome our moderator for this afternoon's session, Stephanie Jones, founder and CEO of Blacks in Travel and Tourism. Thank you so much, Melissa. It is indeed a pleasure to be here with you today as well as our dynamic um, panelists who you all are going to hear from today. Welcome everyone to this conversation, a very important conversation um, that we have been having for the past few months. I am excited to be able to present some of our team members who are some of the top DEI consultants and um, they're going to bring a lot of valuable information to our listeners today. But first, I would like to kick off the conversation with um, Stacy Ritter, President and CEO of the Greater Fort Lauderdale Convention Visitor Bureau. Then you're going to hear from Melissa Majors, CEO of Melissa Majors Consulting. And then we'll hear from Gregory DeShields, the Executive Director of Field Diversity. So Stacy, how are you? I'm surviving. Stephanie, how are you? I'm doing wonderful. Well, you look wonderful. Good. 
in survival <laughs> <Thank> mode. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I got up and well, got dressed for this. So. I know. We tend to do that for the webinars, right? <laughs> <laughs> At well, least from the waist up. Absolutely. Well, thank you again for joining us. Um, I, I think this conversation is very timely and um, even very timely for you as well. So I have a question that I want to pose to you. Um, as the CEO of a leading DMO, when and why did you decide that a DEI training was a worthwhile investment for your staff? And what benefits have you gained personally and expect to gain for your organization by engaging them in diversity, equity, and inclusion training? Uh, thank you, Stephanie. And, and thank you for uh, allowing me to be part of this panel. Um, this is a, um, a topic it's that's our very honor. exciting to me. It's our pleasure. No, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for calling us a leading D DMO. I very much appreciate that. And you that are. As well. You are. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so a little bit about Greater Fort Lauderdale. Uh, we were the first CVB to have an LGBT plus dedicated department, and we've had a multicultural department for a very, very long time. Here in Greater Fort Lauderdale, over 100 languages are spoken in households. We are an incredibly diverse community and have always felt that that diversity has made our community stronger. Um, we feel that if you all look the same and talk the same and act the same, then you're not getting creativity, you're not getting innovation, you're not getting new ideas. And life is a little boring if you're only talking to people who look and sound like you. Exactly. But this year in particular with the pandemic, which has, I think, brought us all to think more internally than we had for a long time, especially in this business, which where we were constantly moving from one place to the next. Now we are set in one place, literally set in one place. It gave mm -hmm. us a chance to think about our, to, to look more internally about how we are approaching issues. Then um, as, the, as the year progressed and we got to the summer, we had protests for social and racial justice, bringing it even more to the forefront, how important it was to, to embrace diversity, inclusion, and equity. So we couldn't control much about the pandemic, if anything, but we knew we could mm -hmm. control our response to the racial and social protests we saw happening throughout the country and which happened here in Fort Lauderdale, not, not far from where I live, actually. Right. I mean, and it was very heartening to see my own community come out and, and support racial and social justice. But it's not a conversation that is comfortable. Um, it's not a conversation that's easy to have. It's not a conversation where you can be easily honest or yes. you, you can be afraid to be honest for fear that you will offend people and that you will look uh, mm -hmm. as horrible as you may think you sound. But we had to do something. Um, we are all, most of us are working from home at the CVB. There are people I haven't seen for months and months and it has caused us to drift apart. Right. I would much have preferred to do this training in person where we were mm -hmm. all in a room. But I also knew that even if we had the opportunity to do that in person, it might not provoke the conversation that you wanted to provoke. I have found in staff meetings generally, when I when we well, when we talk about non-sensitive or non-controversial topics, people are so concerned about giving their own opinion before I give mine right. that I that I knew I wouldn't get an open and candid conversation. And the best way to accomplish the goal was to have people do this online training. Mm -hmm. No longer can um, we talk about diversity, inclusion, and equity as a nice to have. It's a must have, right. whether it's in our hiring practices, how we talk to people prof professionally, how we deal with people personally, uh, especially in the travel world where we are talking to people from all walks of life, from all corners of the globe. It's very important for us to be sensitive and to understand what, what other people are thinking. You know, again, if you only talk to people who look like you, if your executive board or your executive committee or your senior leadership only looks like you, you're not right. getting the rich experiences that you can bring from other people's perspectives. Exactly. That's something that that's something that this training did. And and I can tell you it's about 90 minutes. Um, there are two separate modules. The first one talks about equity and diversity. The second one talks about marketing, which I know we'll get to later. But mm -hmm. it was uncomfortable. Um, you look in a mirror, and if you answer the questions honestly and candidly, as we should, because I told my staff, take the training. I'm not going to know who took the training. I'm not going to see your answers. I'm not going to know what you said. I thought it was very important for them to be shielded by that for, mm -hmm. for fear that, that something would happen to them if I was unhappy with an answer, displeased right. with the direction they were going. So early in October, we launched the, um, the the training modules. 
I, my senior leadership, a couple of from my senior leadership took it first. I thought it was excellent. Um, I saw some things about myself that I liked, and I saw some things about myself that I can do a lot better. And that's what I hope people will take away when they take this training is how to be better, how to, how to be more inclusive, how to, how to focus on a diversity in your, in your senior leadership is, is from my perspective, especially from a professional standpoint, how mm-hmm. to get people around the table who are willing to talk about their experiences, their perspectives, people who don't look like me, you know, in the module, they talk about uh, dominance and non-dominance. And I, I know we'll get into it and I, and I don't want to take over um, anyone else's uh, part here, but the thought that I had never looked at the perspective from the perspective of somebody coming into my, my office, or at mm-hmm. a senior team meeting who wasn't mm-hmm. a white Jewish woman. Yes. Um, how did they feel? I was in a position of power. They were not in a position of power. Was I being inclusive? Was I being open? Was I, was I, was I asking for their opinions or was I just shoving my opinions down their throats because I was mm-hmm. dominant? That, that's a perspective that we all have to change. And this, these modules, this, this training really does help you look at yourself in that mirror and say, what am I doing well? And, and what could I be doing better? That's I mean, where you, it came from. You, you said a mouthful and everything <laughs> you said was, is so on point. Um, I remember having um, an initial conversation with you. And the first thing I wanna say, I commend you, Stacy, um, for your leadership um, and really taking the initiative to want to incorporate change within your organization. Um, Over the past three months, I've had numerous conversations with representatives from different DMOs. And just as Melissa said, um, DEI training seems to be a priority for all of the reasons you just specified. But I think what really uh, moved me is when you sent the email to your staff and I was just so moved by, you know, how transparent as a leader you were to your team. And when I say transparent, when you expressed to them, having taken the training, the DEI, and I think several people are asking, what training are you talking about? She's specifically talking about the DEI deep dive masterclass for DMOs training that Blacks in Travel and Tourism developed and um, Stacy, um, she was so transparent and just sharing how she was personally impacted after taking the course. And so change is not easy, but you have to start somewhere and you have taken a huge step to lead your team and your DMO in a new direction that I have no doubt, you know, is going to enhance your organizational culture Um, but also help your staff um, understand how to um, deal with audiences externally, not only internally, you know, but the training also addresses engaging, understanding and engaging multicultural audiences. And for our purpose for Blacks in Travel and Tourism, you know, we are talking to destinations about how do you um, attract Black travelers, Um, but a lot of that has to do, how do you understand, do you understand Black travelers and what their expectations are when they choose or not choose to come to your destination? So I'm excited that we've had the opportunity to work with you and your team over the past three months, not only through the DEI training, but we did the Black Traveler survey and I'm excited about sharing the results of that. project with you. But again, I think under your leadership, um, moving your staff in this new direction, and you're absolutely right, change is uncomfortable. But within our industry, across the board, now is the time to do things that make us feel uncomfortable so that we can create a better, we can create better destinations for our staff and your local stakeholders but also so that we can create a better and stronger industry that is more diverse, equitable, and inclusive for everyone who wants to participate in it and for those who are already a part of it. So, uh, so there's, there's, again, 
and this is just the first step for us, yes, but it was an important absolutely. first step and change is coming. And those who mm -hmm. don't think that they need to change as a result are putting their, they're putting their heads in the sand. Um, and it isn't just a question of giving lip service to the black uh, tourist, tourist community. You can't just say, yes. oh yeah, we're diverse. We have a hundred languages spoken here in Broward County. So obviously we're diverse. Yes, we are obviously diverse, but it is mm -hmm. so much more than just saying that. That's the that's a code of pain. You have to get you have to really dig underneath internally, looking at yourself. Yes. How am I talking to people? How are how are they perceiving me? Mm -hmm. um, and how can I change that perception? How can I work on myself? How can I change myself so that they are perceiving me differently? They can so that they'll see me as more open, more candid, more transparent. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the email that I wrote to my staff when I took the course and, and told them that, you know, there were some things that just I looked at myself and I, I didn't realize that that was me. Uh, I thought it, it was I was different. Um, it was not an easy thing to to say publicly. Nobody mm -hmm. wants to say, yes, I have unconscious bias. Nobody wants to say it. They're all, mm -hmm. we're all petrified um, to, to say it, but I don't think that there's anybody in, in certain situations that, that don't have that unconscious bias. And one of the things that the course showed was how, how to recognize it and how, and how to work on it and to understand mm -hmm. that, that that doesn't necessarily offend people um, in different situations. It's expected, unfortunately, but there right. are ways to fix it. And one of the ways to fix it is to show diversity in hiring. Um, and and uh, look, I've been through the hire. I work, I'm in a government agency. It takes six months to hire someone. If I can find someone qualified, you know, my first couple of years, like just find that person. I don't care who they are, what color they are, where they come from. Just, it takes so long. But the truth yes. is that it is not a good enough answer anymore to say, oh, I couldn't find anyone diverse. Right. Go back right. and try again. Go back and try again, because there's no position that is important enough to be filled immediately that shouldn't be filled showing a diverse senior leadership team. And 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 that is something that I'm working at, that I'm going to be working on going forward, making sure that the people who work in my senior leadership team are my more diverse, come from different mm -hmm. experiences, because, again, not only is life boring if you're only talking to people who look and sound like you, but you don't get create you don't get creative. If you, Absolutely, I, I, I would I would venture to say that a lot of DMOs feel stuck in a rut right now. Um, there's so much change, there's so much stress that yes. it's very difficult to get motivated and and work on what we need to work on to get things back, mm -hmm. not back is to get things moving forward, not not even right. looking back. Right. But when you're stuck in a rut one of the ways to get out of it is to talk to, to a, div, a diverse team of people who are, Absolutely. who are innovative and creative and come up with new ideas because you can't get out of a rut if you can't come up with new ideas. And sometimes you can't come up with new ideas if you're only talking to people who look and sound like you. Absolutely. I mean, a wonderful point to make. And also what I want to say to you, Stacey, you know, as the leader of your CBB, um, you're not only the leader of your staff, but when you think about you are a partner organization, so you have hundreds of stakeholders that look to the CBB for leadership. And especially when we talk about diversity, equity and inclusion and the social and racial injustices, you know, there are many businesses that are your partners <clears throat> that are stuck as well and are not certain how they should be reacting, whether they should react or whether they should just sit quietly and not say anything, um, even though outside of some of their businesses on Las Olas, there's protests going on. So this is a tremendous opportunity for CEOs such as yourself and every CEO or leadership of DMOs to set the pace, to set the tone for change in your destination, because your partners are looking to you for leadership, whether you know it or not, you know? And so you have a very um, powerful position, you know, and you have a lot of influence as well um, to redirect um, what, how you do things moving forward or to not react and to allow things to continue as they are within your organization, which will also impact how things 
stay the same or change externally within your destination as well. And, and I know that um, there are times when my mouth has gotten me in trouble over the years. <laughs> um, I'm very vocal. My opinions are, are out there um, on social media. I, I didn't think I lost my voice just because I became the CVB president. But um, it's, I think uh, the, the, one of the bottom lines here, and there are several, is don't lie to your partners. Don't lie to your members. Um, don't lie to your staff. When the pandemic came, I think we were all trying to trying to downplay it. Oh, it's just the flu. It's just you know, it's a really bad flu. It'll be fine. Um, it's it's not fine. And and neither is the racial and social justice protests that are going on. Just because the protests may have stopped for the time being, that doesn't mean the problem is solved. And we as a destination need to approach that honestly and with candor and let our partners know that. We are on the side of those who are protesting for racial and social justice. We're not going to shy away from that issue just because we're in tourism. It doesn't mean that we can't have opinions. And it doesn't mean that we can't share those opinions. And we believe that our partners, um, our affiliates should also embrace and recognize that it is time for change in this country and it is coming. And you are either going to be at the front of the bus of this train or you're going to be left behind. And this DMO will not be left behind. Wow, thank you so much, Stacy, um, for sharing your perspective. Um, again, wise words to the ears, <laughs> everyone that's listening. Um, we'll come back around and hear from you again. But right now, I'm really excited that we are able to um, be able to share some of the content from the um, DEI Deep Dive Masterclass series that Stacy um, just talked about. <laughs> We have some of our um, training consultants that are going to be presenting some of the highlights of the masterclass. Um, so I'm certain you will gain a lot of information just from what they're presenting to you today. So right now, it is my pleasure to um, introduce to you Melissa Majors. And Melissa is going to be presenting a foundation, a foundational understanding of diversity, equity, and inclusion as well as discussing what inclusive leadership of self and others means. Take it over, Melissa. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Stacy. oh my goodness. I am so yes. proud of you and your leadership. It, yes. Hearing your words really let us know that we made an impact, that the education helped you drive real change in your organization. That's why we're in this business. So thank you so much for sharing your perspective. So. Last year, 2019, I was in St. Louis Destinations International and I met the woman that you see here on the screen. Her name is Dr. Nicole King-Smith. She is the Chief Learning Officer of NK Enterprise Consulting. And we bonded at that event. And we have continued to have conversations around what really is diversity, equity, and inclusion? What does it mean? How does it apply to our industry? And now I'm so honored that both Nicole and I have been able to contribute to the education that BTT offers. Nicole developed a module, foundational module called Cultural Diversity 101. And she talks about what is diversity, equity, and inclusion. I wanna share her definition with you because it is the definition that is embraced by uh, BTT. Diversity is the representation of all of our varied identities and differences. Equity, seeks to ensure fair and equal treatment for all, and inclusion builds a culture of belonging by actively inviting the contribution and participation of all people. Now she covers not only those foundational concepts and definitions, she goes much deeper into the BTT Cultural Diversity 101, but for this next segment, I wanna camp on inclusion the module that I have developed in, in a collaboration with BTT is called the Seven Habits of Inclusive Leaders. I am a lover of great leadership. I have studied it all of my life. And I started to reflect on and research what do great leaders do to include others? And what I discovered is that great leaders involve others equally. So exactly what does that look like? We're gonna talk about that a bit. And what I discovered in my research is that those leaders, those inclusive leaders have habits and behaviors that fall into seven categories, business, collaboration, mindset, values, decisions, empathy, leading self, 
and people. And so just for today's glimpse into the course, we're going to talk about leading people and self. So uh, I will be vulnerable. We're friends. We're in the same industry and admit to you, I have always wanted to make my bed every day, but I've never been able to develop a habit around it. Like here's what happens in the morning. I get up and I want to make my bed, but I get into this negotiation side of my head. Like I want to make my bed, but I need to pack the kids lunches. I want to make my bed, but I have something else to do. And I talk myself out of it. So I've never been able to really create a habit around making my bed until now. I started applying the if this then model. Now this comes from the Neural Leadership Institute. It is a brain-based model. And what they suggest is that you have to create new neural pathways in your brain to create habits. You have to do something over and over again. And the best way to build a habit is to associate it with a habit you already have. Because just because you want to do something isn't motivation enough to cause you to take action. So they recommend the if this then model. So for me, I associate making my bed to brushing my teeth. If I brush my teeth, then I make my bed. And it takes the guesswork out of building habits around making my bed. And friends, my bed is made today as a result of this model. So as it relates to leadership and inclusion, Stacy talked about it as well. You can want to do something, but until you build habits, that motivation isn't going to turn into action and it won't be sustainable. And so deliberately, this course is built around the if this then framework. Throughout the course, I talk about habits um, based on this model. Try it for anything. It really works when you want to build habits. So again, let's take a deep dive into what it means around uh, in leading people and leading self. Inclusive leaders recognize that conflict is healthy. Stacy talked about this too. It is so healthy, but it's uncomfortable, isn't it? Let's be honest, conflict is not fun at all. But there's research that proves that homogeneous teams are not as innovative as diverse teams. They are quicker to come to decision and get consensus they are less likely to rock the boat. There is pressure to get along. And so oftentimes they avoid conflict, whereas diverse teams are more innovative because they're harnessing the perspective, multiple perspectives. And you know what? Sometimes those perspectives clash. And in, inclusive leaders recognize that you have to harness that intersection of conflicting ideas to really understand and uncover innovative solutions. Brene Brown, huge fan of Brene Brown, in her book called Braving the Wilderness, she talks about it is at the intersection of conflict where real innovation is born. But it's a challenge leaning into that conflict because, again, so often we unplug for fear of conflict. Matter of fact, Patrick Lencioni, the authors of Five Dysfunction of Teams, he lists the fear of conflict as one of the five dysfunctions. And I talk about this related to inclusion because the more diverse you are, the more inclusive you are, the higher the likelihood you are going to experience conflict on your teams. But friends, it's a healthy thing that if you don't figure out how to lean into that conflict and you just unplug because it doesn't feel good, it's uncomfortable, you miss out on some amazing innovative opportunities. So just recognize this, and this is what inclusive leaders do. Here's a habit they have around transforming conflict from one something that feels uncomfortable to something that's really productive. The habit is this. If team members have conflicting ideas, then I will say, although this feels uncomfortable, let's lean in until we thoroughly grasp each other's positions. So try this, it works. And it'll take again, that negotiation out of your mind on, do I say something? Do I not take action? Try this habit, it works. Now, moving on to leading self. Inclusive leaders recognize our social circles shape our perspective. It's the people that are around us, the social circle, those are the folks that we work and play most closely with. Bill Bishop. He's the author of The Big Sort. 
Pace is quoted as saying, we now live in a giant feedback loop, hearing our own thoughts about what's right and wrong, bounce back to us by the television shows we watch, the newspapers and books we read, the blogs we visit, the sermons we hear, and the neighborhoods we live in. To go even deeper, see, we find ourselves in an, an echo chamber. And to go even deeper, thanks to uh, the really cool and powerful, but a bit creepy marketing tools, artificial intelligence tools that are out there that know us and know people like us and what our characteristics are, they serve our opinion back in our social circles online, in the searches that the search results that we find. And so what happens here, friends, is we end up hearing our own opinion bounce back to us over and over and again. And what that does, it cements our opinion that we're really, really right. We're really, really right because everybody that we talk to in our social circle, all the sites that I visit say that my opinion is right. But here's the risk and here's what happens. When we get exposed to an opinion that is different from ours, then we say, oh, wait a minute. I'm really, really right. And everybody I know is really, really right. And you are really, really wrong. And not only are you wrong, you're now the enemy because you disagree with me and on my entire social circle. Inclusive leaders recognize, and, and you know what? You don't have to go further than the political landscape in the United States for evidence of this. Inclusive leaders recognize the risk in allowing that sort of us versus them mentality seep into their decision-making process and seep into collaboration opportunities between team members. They want conflict. They want dissenting views. And inclusive leaders do whatever it takes to make sure that they combat that, again, from leaking into their processes. Here's how they do it. They practice intellectual humility. Intellectual humility is admitting, recognizing and admitting that what you believe to be right might be wrong. You see, our perspectives are limited. We are not all knowing. And so our perspectives are kind of like Swiss cheese. They have holes in them. So when we hear a different perspective, we shouldn't say, no, you're wrong. We should say you're filling in a perspective. You're filling in my blind spots. So often, and I have to thank Chris Voss. He's the author of uh, Never Split the Difference. He was an FBI negotiator for the, uh, for the FBI, excuse me, hostage negotiator for the FBI for 25 years. This dude knows how to get in your head, right? And he talks about a paradox called I am normal, in which we believe the world looks the same to others as it looks to me. So if this situation is fair for me, it must be fair for everybody else, right? We know that's not right. For DMO professionals, destination management professionals, it's important to think about your own destination. Oftentimes we think my destination looks the same to me as it looks to others, right? And that is not right. It is so important. If you don't know and have data that proves what your destination looks like to diverse travelers, then you need to find that out because likely their perspective is going to be very different. And if you don't understand their perspective, how can you empathize with them and appropriately attract them to your destination? So here's a habit that you can adopt based on my research with inclusive leaders. If the majority of my social circle looks and thinks similarly, then I'll accept that I may have blind spots to the experience of others. So with that, friends, we'll just give you a little glimpse into some of the content that's covered in the Cultural Diversity 101 and the Seven Habits of Inclusive Leaders. And with that, Stephanie, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Melissa. Great job. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Greg DeShields. And Greg is going to present an understanding of multicultural audiences and provide some points on how to launch a multicultural marketing strategy. Take it over, Greg. Awesome, thank you. And good afternoon to everyone. Let me start off by saying that um, both Stacy and Melissa just delivered some very powerful words. And I wanna 
provide you some insight as to how you would take that information and apply it. You know, you've learned some of that fundamental about diversity, equity, and inclusion, but you've heard from a very passionate leader how, in fact, it really has to be applied to the work that we do. And I think it's important to take us through a bit of a discussion of really how you apply multicultural marketing in an effective way. So I like to start by showing you this particular slide. So here at PHL Diversity, we've been uh, really reaching out to diverse communities for uh, well over 30 years. And there are ways that you drill down to show your true authenticity. So I don't know how many of you may recognize this statue, but it's of Octavius Cotto. He was an advocate for black people to vote in the late 1800s, 1865 or to be exact. What's interesting about his particular statue, it's the first to be erected on our city hall um, facing uh, south on Broad Street, uh, but it's just a few feet away from where he was murdered, uh, taking a group of black individuals to vote. Let me tell you, this is such a powerful, incredible uh, symbol of how your marketing can really impact a particular destination in a very authentic and sincere way. So let me just have a few words of um, insight that I wanna provide you before I move into um, my actual presentation. So what is multicultural marketing? It's really the practice of marketing to one or more audience of a specific ethnicity. And then typically that ethnicity is outside of what you would consider to be your general market. So multicultural marketing really urges a brand to look deeper into their consumer demographics and outline some specific motivations and aspirations that would impact the purchase decision. Marketers should stay away from stereotypes and when outlining any sort of particular campaign to keep it as authentic and as genuine as possible. Your strategy should really once again display a truth of genuineness to understanding what the consumer needs are and what are at the root of their socioeconomic background. So there are a couple of things that I would say just in that particular statement that are really important. Um, multicultural marketing is evolving and it is evolving because there are different things that are impacting various communities. For the purpose of this conversation, we'll be talking specifically about the African-American market, which means things have become much more part of a normal conversation when you speak to an African-American consumer than it may have been in the past. So things like the Green Book, which has really given us a much clearer context of the evolution of African-Americans and the experience of travel across the country. 20 years ago, the Green Book existed, but it certainly didn't have the well-known representation that has been seen in movie as well as documentary. Also, Black Lives Matter has really defined the African-American traveler in a way that is very different than what we have seen in the past. It certainly is an opportunity for the African-American community to speak to issues of social uh, justice as well as issues of systemic racism. That is at the core of how you have to evolve your, your marketing strategies around speaking out to multicultural communities and specifically the African-American community. So you really wanna lean into what are considered uncomfortable conversations. The conversations that you've heard earlier around DEI begin to connect the dots in terms of applying a lot of the best practices and strategies that have been recommended in order to ensure that you are effectively reaching out to a community in a way that's quite authentic. So in fact, the best multicultural campaign really aims to build some empathy within the ability to connect with that community without necessarily directly pushing a product or service. Now, as it relates to the African-American community, it's a 63 billion uh, travel spend market. So we've known all along that it is an important market. It is one that is significant in terms of the economic opportunities that it brings to our cities. But I wanna point out some specific items that should be a part of your marketing strategy. Let me just make note, there are a couple of things that are not included in this particular slide presentation that I did want to reference. So things like enhancing your insights, and that's really centered upon understanding what are the travel preferences of this particular 
market segment? And then secondly, how do I build relationships in this segment that once again underscores my authenticity? And I think at the end of the day, which is important in any particular marketing campaign that you evaluate, you evaluate, you evaluate, you wanna ensure that the strategy that you've launched is one that is successful and allows for you to make enhancements and updates. So let me go a little bit- Excuse me, Greg, I'm sorry to interrupt you. We cannot see your screen. Can you please share your screen? Right. Going to share, Okay, right. all right, thank okay. you. Great. So the first slide, uh, which I'll spend time on is about analyzing data. So in the in the in the focus around developing your multicultural marketing campaign, you really would like to compile data that tells the nuances and the stories of your target market. There is no one size fits all in this particular approach in creating a multicultural marketing strategy. What you want to do is have a vast uh, rep. Um, depository of data and information that can help you to have great insights about being much more accurate in terms of your interpretation of your customer or the particular market. You want to comb through this data and be mindful of any sort of advanced analytics that you can get in order to ensure that you have correctly identified and targeted the segment in a way that allows you to be as authentically connected to them as possible. Uh, the next slide speaks to the issue of engaging ethnic cultural experts. So you really want to enlist the input of individuals on your team or cultural experts who have detailed knowledge about the experience of working within the particular market. And then you want to test that content to see how, in fact, it resonates. Collaborating with the right partner allows you to infuse priceless empathy into your campaign and ensure that your brand is positioned in a way that is relatable and it is transparent. Investing in such partners can save a great deal of hardship and spare you the embarrassment of taking the wrong approach in terms of reaching out to a particular community. You know, reaching out to local cultural organizations, uh, working with uh, specific academic institutions that may have a particular center of resources that they can make available, uh, certainly reaching out to any of the museums that you may have, getting that kind of insight helps you to ensure that you have accurately engaged a very vibrant and meaningful conversation with individuals who can ensure that you've made the right decisions around developing a campaign. And the third item I'll just list with you, and um, we've talked about it, is to be authentic. Settle on ideas that truly make sense given the market research. Figure out how you're going to demonstrate this product or service in a way that resonates with your intended audience. So you want to flush, you want to be able to flush out the production schedule that you have developed and be mindful of what is the best time and what is the best day and what is the best vehicle in order to reach a particular community. Additionally, taking into account what is the holiday schedule, what are the festival schedules and what kind of cultural collaborations are there that you could create uh, in order to build a stronger connection to uh, your audiences. What's really important about the idea of being authentic and communicating in an effective way is that you build relationships, you build credibility, and realize that through this plan, there has to be a long-term commitment in order to build the relationships that not only start the process, but builds a stronger bridge to you being able to secure business as you move forward. So that's it. That's what I have. Uh, make it relatively easy for you in order to reach out to multicultural markets. Realize there's a lot more that we can provide in greater detail and certainly taking part in the program uh, will provide you that insight. So thank you very much. And Stephanie, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, at this time, we welcome any questions for our panelists. Um, if you have any questions, please do post them in Q&A. Um, what I would like to ask my panelists, if you can turn your videos on. Thank you. Wonderful. Awesome. So um, right now, I think we did answer a lot of the questions already, but if anyone has any questions for Stacy or Melissa or Greg um, or myself, please do post your question. 
If not, what I'd like to um, ask Stacy, um, what are what would be your advice for DMOs um, who are still contemplating? You know, what's the best course of action um, to engage their team in DEI training? Uh I always seem to go first. Is this an age before beauty thing, people? <laughs> no, it's a definitely beauty. beauty <laughs> uh, okay. We did not set that up ahead of time. Um, I, and this is going to sound like I'm shilling here, and I'm not. Um, this this master class is the best step one. It It teaches you so much about... It's funny when I talk about this, it's like when I'm, I'm going to start to cry because I feel so deeply about the need for everybody in this in the travel industry to embrace the concept of change and and to be leaders in that space and and the change is in the social and racial justice area but you can't get there unless you are able to recognize where you are flawed and where your team may have some holes um, and we can all say it. We can all, you know, oh, yes, I need more of this. I need more women of color. I need more, you know, men of color. I need more brown people. We can all say it. Um, mm -hmm. And we can all mean it. But we don't all do it. And we don't all live it. And this class taught me personally. I'm not, I'm 60 years old. You can teach an old dog new tricks. Mm -hmm. This class taught me personally about what I needed to do to make myself a better not just a, a better leader in my professional life, but a better person to the people who uh, I surround myself with and to reach out to people who I don't surround myself with, who I need to. Melissa says this in, in her class. If, if you are only looking at people who, who sound like you and you're only talking to people who come from your, from your background, you are much less, you, you are less rich than you could be in your experiences in your passions and your beliefs. And this class has taught me so many things about myself, my team, and my industry that I know that, that Greater Fort Lauderdale DMO can be a leader in this space and will be a leader in this space. And I would encourage everyone who is similarly situated, um, whether you come from diverse communities or not, because the truth of the matter is, is it, even if your community is not as diverse as mine is, your travelers are going to be diverse and you need to know how to talk to them as well as the people who live in your, in your city, in your county, in your state. So, I mean, take this class. Again, I'm not shilling. I only get paid by Broward County. I promise <laughs> you, my paycheck only comes from the county administrator. This class opened my eyes and I know it opened the eyes of the people who work with me. All right, Stacy. Stephanie. Yes, please. Stacey, do. you're the best <laughs> student ever. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. And you had talked earlier about biases, how so often we are not willing to, we don't think we're biased. Well, friends, if you have a brain, you're biased. I mean, biases are our brain's threat detector, but so often we are not willing to admit we have biases because we think it'll be perceived that we're a racist or a bigot or something. That's not the case. And to your point, as you mentioned, Stacey, until you're able to recognize and accept, yep, I have biases, what are they? Then you can't, you can't resolve them or they'll control your actions. And it isn't that we're flawed. It's just our perception or it's the, stro the social system that's been passed down to us. Um, and it's kind of like a house that we inherited. Yeah, it's flawed in the foundation, the walls and things like that. We didn't build it, but we can remodel or we can leave it the same, you know, what's your choice. So thank you for sharing that, Stacey. But I, I would definitely add to, you know, the point as you drill it down to your particular destination and the more conscious you become of issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, the more effective you can be. But realize you're the marketing tool that really helps to bring the overall destination together. So the reality of it is, is you're not doing this alone. You know, you have to take your knowledge and your expertise and build it within your local community, whether it's within your hospitality segment, your, your hotel mm -hmm. segment, your restaurant segment, your city government, your policing. I mean, there are a number of other partners who are gonna have to make this work. You can't just say we have a great diverse destination. There mm -hmm. has to be a connectivity with those who are in your market, which is why engaging community uh, insights and voices around the um, needs of the customer 
and the service delivery that's available in your destination, uh, it really helps to create a more authentic and believable experience for a customer. You know, the idea that I, you know, proudly display the Octavius Cotto statue is because a lot of people, when they come to Philly, they want to go and get their picture taken there. And that's a really important part of, you know, the authenticity of your destination. I also think it's important to lean into whatever your destination has. And, and that can certainly serve as a part of the overall visitor experience. And you don't necessarily need to manipulate it. You just need to tell the truth. And the more right. honest you are with your customer, the more believable your story is. But I strongly encourage you to do the internal work as Stacy has talked about and look at all those nuances of best practice that Melissa has talked about. And those go into your toolbox mm -hmm. in order to work through all of the other partners who are gonna to have to support this. Because at the end of the day, it's the destination that has to deliver. You create your campaign and you can outline all of these assets but as I'm there for three days, I need to have an authentic and a very believable experience. Awesome. A few questions have come in. So I'm going to go back to you, Stacy. then I'm coming back to you, Greg. Um, someone says, how can DMO CEOs get buy-in from their boards related to the imperatives around DEI training and equitable community and economic development? Um, great question. And, and I had to say that I'm very lucky. My Tourist Development Council is an advisory board only. They have no ability to tell me how to spend the money, where to spend the money, or why to spend the money. They can only make recommendations. So that gives me some freedom that others may not have. But if your board members, first of all, look around your board table. Is your board diverse? Uh, do you have a board that reflects your community? Do you have a board that reflects what you want your community to look like? That's number that's number one. Because if your board again looks like you, or it, you know is is ninety percent white, is ninety percent male, um, and doesn't have a, a variety of experiences, you're not going to get the creative ideas that you need to get out and 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 move your destination forward. But talk to your honestly, have your board go through the training uh, if they don't see it and. and I would be hard pressed right now to find anybody in my destination that didn't recognize the need for change. They may not embrace it. They may not be passionate about it. They may come reluctantly, but all you have to do is turn on the news and see what's going on in this country to recognize that change is here. Um, let's hope it continues to move in the direction it's moving. It seems to have slowed down a little bit, maybe because that's an election. there's an election in 13 days and everybody's holding their breath. Um, on either side, but change is here and be part of the solution. D don't, don't be part of the status quo. Look at yourself in the mirror, take, take this course. It's not an expensive course. Take the course, have your board take the course, have your senior leadership take the course. We had everybody take it in, in my CBB, um, but that's a good start. But, you know, if, if, if they haven't bought into the fact that change needs to happen and that that racial social justice and embracing equity, diversity and inclusion isn't a thing that's here to stay, then I would suggest you look at for the new board members. I know that sounds really harsh and I know that's easier said mm. than done. My board members have terms. I can't just kick them off. Um, but change needs to happen at your board. Thank you, Stacy. awesome. Greg, um, one of the things, well, before we come to you, Greg, I would like to just remind our listeners, if you could please post your questions in the Q&A instead of the chat so that we make certain that we see them, please. So if you posted something in chat, if you can post it in Q&A, we would greatly appreciate it. Thank you. So Greg, um, regarding your module, okay, um, someone says, um, is the second module of the training appropriate for all team members at the DMO if they do not work directly with marketing? The first module sounds good for all. Thank you. Greg? So yes, I would say that it is applicable to all. You know, there is really an emphasis around you delivering a very authentic um, interpretation of your destination. Uh, it's about engaging um, various representatives from that community. Um, but it's also understanding the business case around why 
you were pursuing you were pursuing this particular segment. And I would think as a follow up to Stacy in terms of engaging board members, it is about being able to articulate the business case. And that's why we start with discussing the analytics. You do need to do your due diligence and realize what is the economic value of this particular segment and how can through the work that we do that we bring more economic impact to our community. Uh, as we all know, the diversity, equity, and inclusion is good for society, but as DMOs, we have a responsibility to deliver economic value and to ensure that we can mm. create fantastic paying jobs for those who work in our destinations. So it is about the business case. And I think as it relates to this particular module, when we reference the fact that the African-American market is $63 billion, that's a clear indication that as a market, we need to focus our efforts around it wherever we sit in our organization, because it's good, not just for the business that we do, but it's good for our destination. So I would say absolutely, it is without any doubt applicable to all across the organi organization. Thank you, Greg. Melissa, here's a question. How can you be more diverse in your your organization or board when your community isn't that diverse? Mm. Well, I question. think it's a great question. There, as Greg mentioned, there's a business imperative associated with being inclusive, right? And if you don't have that within your immediate uh, region or your destination, I think you create some exceptions and find ways to source diversity into your, uh, your leadership teams and your boards. I mean, the pandemic certainly has taught us you can collaborate and meet virtually. So the person doesn't necessarily have to sit in your backyard to contribute to your strategy. So I would say reach beyond your, your normal borders and bring people in from, from other locations if necessary. Awesome. All right, thank you. Uh, let's see, I think Melissa Cherry, I have a question for you. Um, it says, would Destinations International consider providing DMOs with a toolkit of how to discuss this with our stakeholders. We need facts and statistics to help us back up the business case for why DEI matters for the tourism industry, both for our organization and for our destinations. Yes, actually um, working with our uh, EDI task force that I mentioned at the kind of beginning of this webinar, we are working on just that. We are really working to get the examples of what destination organizations are doing. Um, out there right now in terms of equity, diversity, inclusion program and initiatives in their communities, um, you know, working with folks like Greg DeShields and Stacy and others in their destinations to continue to create those case studies to be part of that toolkit. Um, in addition to that, we've also worked with Bill Geist at DMO Pros to have um, really a, a look at what board diversity looks like and really a step-by-step -step process on how to do that. So we are continuing to build those tools and releasing those through the end of this calendar year. Um, so a lot of that stuff will, will be available very soon, um, but we will make sure we, we share those resources as part of our post webinar link um, after the session today. Awesome, thank you, Melissa. Here's a question and actually I'd like to take a stab at um, it said, this question may have been asked, but how do you handle when leadership didn't make a statement when the most recent racial events were happening? Do you think it's up to leadership to put out a statement on racial injustice issues or to sit silent and go dark on social media channels? I like to speak from my perspective in having the opportunity, having the opportunity to have met with several DMOs over the past three months and having this exact conversation with them. And what I've said to them, your staff, your local stakeholders, and black travelers that you may want to attract your destination and inbound travelers um, in general, they will hear what you don't say. If you do not make some type of statement or at least acknowledge what's happening in our nation. And if there is protest specifically happening in your destination, if you do not acknowledge what's happening. And again, that's why I have to go back to Stacy and commend her and for having the boldness, um, you know, to allow BTT to work with her and her team to actually develop a Black Lives Matter position statement. There are very few DMOs that have made or issued a statement, whether on their website or their social media. And again, I say, they will hear what you do not say. Um, so it's really up to the leadership of the DMO 
to really um, determine, you know, how do they want to lead during this time in our nation and within your destination as it, re as it relates to Black Lives Matter? Will you be silent? Because again, as I stated to Stacy, as a DMO, your members, your partners, all of your local stakeholders, they look to you for leadership. So this creates a tremendous opportunity for DMOs to take the leadership in helping to reshape, reframe the conversation around diversity and inclusion and around Black Lives Matter because there are a lot of people that think Black Lives Matter is controversial, when in fact it is not. So here's an opportunity for DMOs to one, educate themselves about Black Lives Matter and what's happening, whether it's in your local destination or within our nation, and to have those conversations internally with your team, and even to have those invite people from your, um, your stakeholders to, to engage in that conversation with you. And I do know a lot, many DMOs have reached out to their local community organizations to bring people together to have discussions around what is the best way forward to address the racial injustices and Black Lives Matter. Stacy or Melissa, would either of you like to add to that? You know, this is Greg. I, I, I just want to jump in here because it's a lot to unpack. Let it me just is. start off by saying that if you're going to write a statement, it needs to be authentic to your organization. And it should not be about checking a box. If your organization has had an authentic and a genuine belief that diversity, equity, and inclusion is important, and you've been able to articulate that by various communities, I think you can deliver a statement that is real and authentic to your organization. Realize that those who write statements are certainly going to be observed in terms of their ability to continue to fulfill whatever is within that statement. Um, I think that it should be written with, as we've discussed, input from people from your local community. And certainly, if you are going to write a statement about Black Lives Matter, somebody Black should be at that table <laughs> and help you yeah. to ensure that you are not putting in a catchy phrase, at least that you might perceive to be a catchy phrase, that has absolutely nothing to do with authenticity. I think it's also realizing the diversity of your destination. You may not have ethnic diversity, but there are a variety of different of dimensions associated with diversity. And perhaps there's another way that you can tell that story based upon the diversity that is prevalent in your community. So I would caution you about that process. It has to be as authentic and as genuine and as real as it can be. It has to have voices from those communities. And I think you have to be mindful that you'll be held accountable. Someone will evaluate a year from now, well, you said this, what did you do? Mm -hmm. So it's a lot that has to be unpacked in this. And I think that any organization that proceeds to do it should definitely take it as seriously as it is the mission and the vision statement that they post for their organization. And, and Greg, Greg is right. I mean, you can't come, mm -hmm. you can't come at this and say, "Oh, BLM is the, is the latest trend," um, as we do in in travel mm -hmm. generally. What are the trends? What are people talking about? You can't say, "Oh, well, this is the latest trend, so I'm gonna I'm gonna get on this bandwagon," or "This is the latest fad, so I'm gonna make mm -hmm. sure that everybody knows that I'm a supporter of BLM because you know it's in the newspaper." You really do have to live the value, um, and and you have to show that you're living the value. And when and when you're talking about tourism in general, when people come here and they expect they expect to see that um, that you are living that value, and you don't um, meet that expectation, then they're going to tell everybody, and and you will see you will be inauthentic. So you do have to be careful, and you have to make sure that what you're talking when when you're speaking, it really does come from the heart, and you're not just checking. Oh, okay. This is the this is the BLM box this week and next week it'll be you know um, Hispanic month. I got to check a box because I have to write about something about that and and um, and then you know wi women's month or you know whatever. The, you can't just say ah oh, this is the latest fad or trend. I'm going to jump on that bag bad wing. It has to be real. It has to be real. People are going to know if it's not. And the last thing you want to do is show people that you're not real Absolutely. or express that to people. Have them think you're not. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm going to um, pose one more question and either of our panelists can feel free to answer. It says, when demonstrating and discussing DEI, how do we communicate metrics other than skin color? I don't know how to ask this question, 
But it seems to me that this is an outdated metric as cultures and communities, even families are not specific to skin color. Would anyone like to address that? I mean, I think if you are going to do, if you are going to do any sort of metric analysis, it can be qualitative, it can be quantitative. And perhaps as how you increased and improved the quality of the experience and customer satisfaction surveys can give you that as a metric to show that the work, the efforts that you've done have helped to change people's minds and deliver them great experience. Uh, it can certainly be quantitative when you look at, quite frankly, the economic impact. Have we increased spend? Have we brought more business opportunity to um, various uh, businesses and retail outlets in our particular market? Uh, those are some of the standard um, measure measurement tools that you can implement. I think in our industry, though, because we provide experiences, one that's really um, a good way to um, define it through some sort of measurement is what do people think? Um, you know, do they perceive us as a very diverse destination? You do the, the front of the campaign and at the end of the campaign, you see if you've changed people's minds. I mean, those two approaches can help to give you metrics that you can build upon as you go forward. I, I think metric. sometimes, oh, sorry, Melissa. No, go ahead, Stacy. I think sometimes you have to do things just because you know they're right, regardless of your ROI. And I know that we're all about putting heads in beds and I know that we've all seen a great tumble in our revenues. I mean, we're no exception to that rule, but there's not necessarily always data or an algorithm or a metric to back up what, that what you know is doing, that, that you're doing the right thing. And I, I would be hard pressed to, I mean, I'm a lawyer by profession. I could argue two sides of basically every issue if I needed to, but I would be hard pressed to argue the other side of why this doesn't matter. So I was recently involved in an assessment for a destination and we discovered how incredibly important it was for potential travelers to feel safe when they arrived at your destination. Like I, I wanna say it's 89% of the LBGTQ community uses, will they feel welcome and is it friendly? And that is the number one most important criteria as they're making decisions on where they go. And as we dug deeper into that, there were commonalities across, um, across demographics of people who are excluded, who have experienced a, a, a history of exclusion, that safety and a welcoming environment is at the top of their list as they're making their decisions. So knowing that's so important, I would encourage you to find a way to measure that metric whether you're piggybacking on the net promoter score, will do diverse um, travelers recommend your destination when they leave. But those are some, I think, emerging metrics that will become even more important as we, we evaluate our destinations. Thank you, thank you. All right, so what I'm gonna ask each of our panelists to do before we wrap up, um, final thoughts, um, briefly, Stacy. Your final thoughts on moving forward. If, <laughs> we provided a lot of great information on DEI. What are your final thoughts that you like to leave our listeners? I don't, uh, honestly, I don't think that, that there's anything that I haven't said about how I feel about this issue and in particular, this masterclass. Um, if you wanna grow, if you wanna move forward personally and professionally, this is the right thing to do. And you will find out things about yourself that again, you'll like and probably things that you don't like, but that you will be able to work on. And it, you know, personal improvement. I, 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 I always, I tell this to my staff and they probably are sick of hearing it. And I think some of them are probably on, they're gonna roll their eyes, but feel them roll their eyes when I say this, but you know what, if you don't, if your destination doesn't evolve, then you die, it dies. If you personally don't evolve and grow, then you die. This is the next step in, certainly was the next step in my evolution. I hope it's the next step in the evolution of the people who work with me. And I would encourage everybody who's watching this webinar to take that next step for themselves as well. Thank you, Stacy. Melissa? As you evaluate yourself and you look into that mirror like Stacy did, forgive yourself. We all have biases ingrained in us. And so often if we look in that mirror and we feel guilty, we choose apathy and we actually don't make change. So 
forgive yourself up to this point. You may have made mistakes, but recognize that we all have biases, but make a commitment not to let those control your actions moving forward. And the first step is just having a very honest conversation with yourself. Forgive yourself and forgive others. And let's just, uh, let's evolve and move forward. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you, Melissa. And Greg? So I would say that the you know, tourism and hospitality industry has suffered its most devastating blow in our lifetime. And as an industry, we are one that certainly will persevere through this, but we will change as an industry. And I think we have had the opportunity to gain a tremendous amount of insight over the last eight, nine months, especially the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think as we rebuild this industry, it is gonna be crucial that we are committed to engaging the principles, the fundamentals that we have learned in order to ensure that our industry will not just come back much more diverse and inclusive, but much more successful than we were before. So I look forward to the future anxiously. Awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I'd just like to share a couple slides okay. as we close out. All right. I'm glad this wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are you able to see my screen? Let's see. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Great. Great, great. Um, again, I want to say thank you to Melissa Cherry and the Destinations International team for partnering with the National Blacks and Travel and Tourism Collaborative to present this very important and timely conversation. Um, I look forward to us continuing to engage not only um, in conversations around DEI, but other important conversations that I know are very relevant to DMOs, such as local stakeholder engagement, multicultural marketing. Um, those are some areas that we know a lot of DMOs are experiencing pain points. So however BTT can be of assistance uh, to your DMO or your organization in these areas, uh, we welcome the opportunity to engage with you and for you also to be a part of BTT. Uh, many of you were asking about um, information on how to access the course. Um, you can access the course here at BTT think um, think it think if it um, dot com um, you can also inquire about um, groups if you have um, uh, your staff that you would like to enroll in the program please send us an email at contact us at blacks and travel and tourism dot org you can learn more about btt at blacks and tourism dot org and i do believe that melissa cherry will be sharing more information about the course to all of those who have participated um, this course, the DEI Deep Dive for DMOs, is only one of many courses that we will be offering through the Diversity Tourism Academy um, in first quarter 2021. So not only can you access courses on DEI, you can also add, you will also be able to um, access courses on multicultural marketing, local stakeholder engagement trainings, um, and several other topics around cultural heritage tourism that we will be offering through the um, Diversity Tourism Academy. So I, again, want to say thank you to our panelists, Melissa, Greg, Stacy. you all did a phenomenal job. Thank you for the wonderful content you provided to everyone. So now at this point, I would love to turn it back over to Melissa Cherry. And thank you all again. It was a pleasure serving as your moderator. And thank you, Stephanie, for leading us today. We are truly grateful for your partnership and looking forward for the opportunities that this course in, in will offer for our destination members. So thank you, Stephanie, again, Greg, Stacy, and Melissa. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for being you know, honest and authentic and very much sharing your perspectives. Um, this concludes today's webinar. Uh, we will be sharing a link post this webinar with all of the links and discussions that we talked about, including how you can get access to the course. There is special discount pricing for DI members. So please um, take hold of the code that's included in that. And we'll also share resources um, in terms of the board diversity steps that I mentioned earlier on the call that we worked with SearchWide 
um, and also with Bill Guys at DMLs Pro. So thank you everyone. Check back on the Destinations International website for information on future webinars and additional resources. Thanks so much for joining us and everyone have a great day. Bye-bye.